It is my great pleasure to introduce Didier Kalos, who is right now a professor at the University of Cambridge uh, in England. And the one thing about introducing Didier is that in Exoplanet's community, he is really, really well known, of course, as he will talk to you about. He will uh, show you how he found the first planet around another star. And I think he'll also tell you that it was his PhD project. And so the problem is my PhD students are coming in and like, so I want to discover the first planet or the first something. I was like, no, sorry, you know, there's a Swiss astronomer who actually beat you, do that. Among a lot of um, prices that I'm not gonna name, uh, Didier has a Frontiers of Knowledge Award. And I think you will see in his talk that that's what he's doing. He's pushing knowledge, he's pushing technology, and he's finding very interesting things out there. Didier? Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> So it's a, it's a real honor to be here, and, and it's a true pleasure to be part of this uh, fantastic, exciting event. When, when Lisa invited me to come, I, it took me half a second to decide I would just manage my schedule to come, because I think for me it was a great opportunity to come for the first time to Cornell. I never had the chance to come here, and uh, I never had the opportunity and the chance to meet Carl. And, um, and in a way, I, I can claim that I am one of the of the kind of uh, son of Carl in terms of science, because because when I was a young adult, when I was starting my 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 studies in physics, I mean, uh, or just before actually, I I I encountered this this famous Cosmos book and the series, and and it's still right now on, on the top of my, of, of my list of the most influential book I ever read uh, that brought me to science. So, so that was an even better reason for me to come here and to, uh, to be part of, of that event. Um, I also had the chance to, uh, to know Lisa since a long time, since 98, the first extrasolar planet school. I mean, in 98, it became obvious that it was a becoming official kind of science. Um, and uh, that would have deserved a school. And Lisa was there as a student at that time. And uh, another famous uh, female student was also there. It's, it's Sarah Siegel also. So, so it's an interesting time. Um, so um, I'm about to tell you uh, kind of an old story, which is the, the story of the discovery of the, of the first planet orbiting a star other than the sun. Um, but, but there are a couple of things that I think has been said already, which is, which is very profound. Is, is the, you understood that science is a, is a long continuum. I mean, we connected to the time, really, in science. And um, I think it was obvious in all the talks you had before. I mean, all these talks before clearly demonstrated that that was not the first time this idea came. And it's a long idea. And um, a lot of attempts had been made progress being made, surprise being made. So this, this continuity, I think, is really at the core of, of the discovery of this other world. And starting from our own solar system, so just to give you a bit of the perspective of how we place this discovery, I think, is starting by the solar system. So these are what us, I say, uh, the uh, the, from the beginning of the humanity, practically I've been look, seeing is all the planets you can see by the eyes. You don't see this like that. It's just point moving around. And you know that the origin of the name planet comes from the Greek, which means uh, moving body in the sky. So for a long time, and this was the only thing that, that we had, it's interesting to, to realize um, as a scientist that with just this and the, and the eyes, we have built a little picture about the solar system we have understood, and, and the college where I'm, 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 I'm from in Cambridge, which is Trinity College, and we had Newton there, and this Newton described the whole theory to explain the planes. It's just by looking at the eyes. So I think it's interesting to give this connection. So in a way, when we got going to the other planet on other stars, 
It's just the continuity that has been started with <coughs> early days uh, explorations. So exploration is really the, the key word here in this game, and discovery as well. Um, the, the exploration of the solar system has always been related to discoveries. So, so you know when we started to get the first telescopes, and Sir Urchel, uh, practically in his garden, built a telescope big enough and we're able to see Uranus here. Um, that was the first time we expanded, since so long, the size of the solar systems. Using the Uranus orbit, looking at the orbit, and uh, using the mathematics developed by Newton, and the gravity theory, people were able to predict there will be another planet a bit, a bit further out, which was Neptune's. Very interesting story. At the end, it's a big race, and Le Verrier got it right, and then you get, you get a bit... Uh, a bit less than 100 years la la later. Then you know this, this frantic search and after this for if there is anything else. So, so you know this fantastic story of which um, was seen for a long time as the outskirt boundary of the solar system, but it was mentioned uh, uh, with the talk of Anne, uh, this very influential work of Kuiper, in a way to predict that everything would be a bit more complicated than that. And you all know that in 92, uh, it became obvious that there were really a whole population of objects. This is an artistic view. I would love to get this picture from a spacecraft. It's a bit difficult to get. <laughs> you get it out of the plane <laughs> quite far. So, so this is the planets. You see Pluto uh, around, and you see all these this, this bodies, which is, which is now part of a very complex structure. It's called the Kuiper Belt, which is very interesting because it tells you about, a lot about the history of the solar system. So you've seen how we have been far, starting from the few planets, that you can get by the eyes until the point now we have a very complex picture of spacecraft going to most of this body and, and especially going to the outskirts right now of the solar system. So again, explorations. It's all about explorations and knowledge that is connected what has been done before. Um, so, so speaking then about, about going to, um, to the other stars. Um, well, the problem you have uh, when you want to find a planet on the other stars is, is you're really dealing with a tremendous difficulty, which is a planet is almost nothing compared to a star. The mass of the planet is 1,000th time smaller than the stars. Uh, it's, it produces almost no light compared to the stars. So you really have to, to use tricks to have a hint that there is something orbiting that, that star. So it was, it was mentioned by Dave that the, 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 from the early days of the understanding of the Doppler shift, it is the relation when you move something, if you have a wave, whatever wave it is, can be sound, can be light, uh, you have a shift in the color and the wavelengths of that, of, of that wave. It's called the Doppler effect, French uh, physicist from the mid-90s. And, um, and looking at the stars, when you have the orbiting planet around it, uh, you have the motions of the light of that star. Practically what we do, we have a, more than just the light, we have what's called spectral line. It's a bit like a, uh, an imprint of the star related to the structure of, of the element that is in the atmosphere of, of that star. You have iron, for example, produce a lot of lines and structure uh, that, that you can use, it's a bit like a barcode, that you can use to trace exactly what is the speed. So, so this technique was known since a long time. From, from, from the first time we got spectra from the star, which is almost 100 years. Um, and, the, and, the, and, and the idea that you may be, use, you may be using this, the observation of the speed of the stars to detect something that you would not see orbiting that stars uh, uh, is long. But the difficulty you have in, uh, when you want to look with something very small is the amplitude of this motion you have to deal with. So I don't want to enter into too many details, but I just want to give you a little bit of 101 fla flavor, what it means detecting a speed of a planet if you build what's called a spectrograph. So a spectrograph is a machine which produces what's called a rainbow, split the light, spread the light, different wavelength. And, um, and then you can compare with your, with your with whatever, your, your cell phone picture, and whether pixels, you see, when you have a lot of pixels, depending on the size of, uh, and how, 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 uh, how new is your, is your phone to take picture. And, and in terms of when you measure the speed, we have a similar kind of uh, resolution equivalent, which is called the spectral resolutions. And <coughs> the best you can do, for plenty of good optical reason, I want to explain, is having a resolution which is called the 100,000 time. So you resolve the light, by 100,000 
uh, time. Practically, it means that a pixel of your cell phones seen from a spectrograph would give you about a speed of 3,000 meters per second, three kilometers per second, three kilometers. So, so it is the size of the best picture you can do with a spectrograph. So if you have a change of that speed, practically it will, you would see the change on the pixel scale. So in theory, when you use a spectrograph to measure the speed of a star, you cannot do better than that. If you want to do better than that, you have to use tricks. And that was what has been described by, by Dave Latham before, a couple of tricks that can be used to try to detect something below that limit. So you can imagine how challenging it may be when you have a machine which is almost blind and you want to see something which is much smaller than that. Because when you want to detect a planet like Jupiter, this is 13 meters you need to get. So you're completely blind and you really want to see through the blindness something very small. And to give you a little bit the challenge of detecting the Earth, what it would be, uh, it's, again, it's again another order of magnitude here. So, so it's something that was in the air since a long time, and there's a couple of key, peep, uh, key uh, papers in the, in the 60s, in the 80s, that describe approach and ways to do that, but the practicality to implement that uh, took a long time. And that's the reason why the idea is old, but the outcome of the detection is pretty new, because we needed to be able to, uh, to achieve this. So to understand a bit the context where we were evolving in the 90s, and it was a bit picture before, um, seen from the astronomy, astronomer perspective, you can simplify your, your problem as much as you can, where practically you say, OK, this is the solar system. We use it as a template, because that's all what we have right now. And uh, we just try to, we don't, we don't deal with the structure of the planet. We just, just look at where they are and what are the mass. So this is the mass of the planet you see in this against a distance. So one AU, it's a distance to the Earth, one, uh, and that is the mass of, the, of Jupiter, so you need to, to, uh, to have 300 times the mass of the Earth to, to, to make a Jupiter. So this is a solar system seen from a very simple, simple way uh, uh, from the astronomy point of view. Um, and there's a lot of things that is interesting in this picture. Well, the first thing you, you, you get is, is it, the, the small mass planet are, are much closer than, than the big mass planet. The exact value here, you can challenge it, but it's still a fact. I mean, practically, if you would use the solar system as a template, well, you expect the big planet, which is the more massive, and if practically the, the, the easiest to find, have to be a bit away from, from the stars. There is plenty of good reason for that. It's related to the formation mechanism of the planet, the theory, which, by the way, it's working pretty well I mean, uh, for the solar system. It, it's pretty good as a predictive theory to explain what's going on in the solar system. So we must be too wrong to use it as well on the other stars. So in the mind of most of the people, when you were looking for planet, the, the best expectation you could have is trying to find something like Jupiter somewhere away from the stars. Maybe it's what, it doesn't need to be, to be 5 AU, it could be 1 AU, but still, clearly something that's a bit of the outskirt of the, of, uh, of the, of the stars. So, so practically what happened, I mean, you know, the, 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 the object that was found uh, was a real shock. And I will come back on, the, on the, some detail of the detections. Because on that diagram, the, the planet omitting the star 51 peg is here. Uh, it's log scale, so there are a lot, a lot of uh, uh, distance between this Jupiter and that Jupiter. So it's about the mass of Jupiter, but it's farther, farther off what you would expect in terms of distance. And if you want to compare with this planet, it's even closer to the stars, and it's not right the right mass at all. So practically, that planet should not exist at all, according to what we know from the solar systems. So we know that there is ways to understand this, but at that time, it was a real shock uh, to get this. And uh, I can say that very few people believed that it was a planet for a long time, until another team find uh, what's called a transit, and there will be a talk after that, on a planet similar to that. So this planet, very close to the, uh, to the stars, it is so close that the planet is extremely hot. Uh, that's the reason why they bear the name of hot Jupiter, because they have the mass of Jupiter, but they're far, far closer to the stars, uh, 20 times closer than, than, than the Earth orbit. 
uh, and ending up to be very hot because just 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 the, the uh, too much energy uh, 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 beaming from from the from the star to the to the planet. So so practically, this is how it looks like uh, in this system. And uh, in terms of discovery, the the picture of the planet we have is this. So this is the evidence, the fact that we have found a planet. Practically what we have here is the amplitude of the motion that we detected. So this is meter per second, so it's about 60-70 meter amplitude here. And, and, and that's, that's the time. And we, we phase it because of the time of the orbit, so you can just wrap the time of the orbit. Um, so, so this is a challenge of discovery, and, and you can appreciate, I mean, the uh, whole, in a way, precise is the measurements. And that's practically the key of the discovery. Practically, to detect this, what happened in real time is one day you measure one point uh, here, another day you measure another one here, the day after you measure one here, the day after you measure one. Then you really see the, the something is, is moving in, into the stars in real time, practically, and, and, and you don't need to have a clever, clever algorithm to find out. It's obvious because your machine you build is so accurate that it gives you right away the evidence there is something. Well, practically, in the real life, it didn't happen exactly like that. This is, this is the theory, <laughs> the way it goes. Because when we started the program in 94, uh, we had a couple of, uh, well, we have a couple of issues. First of all, it was the first brand new machine that we had. So, so uh, it means that we have no experience of that kind of new machinery. Um, and the other one, um, we were expecting planet are much farther out than this one, not a short part planet. So uh, after so much time designing and building the instrument, my PhD advisor decided it was a good time for him, for him to take up a sabbatical in Hawaii. Good choice. So off he went in April 94, and he let me the key of the machinery to say, okay, just have fun and just start the program. And uh, he told me on purpose, you know, Didier, don't expect to find any planet. It's where you, it's gonna take time, you can do that in your PhD. And I thought, I just don't care. I think it's so much fun to go in OHP, observe the Ardour Provence, to go there to observe, off I go. So you cannot imagine my surprise uh, when, uh, when uh, off, out of the few stars that we decided to pick as a standard stars, exactly like you, uh, Dave, about 15 stars we picked to be the one that we would measure every time, I found this, two, after two or three measurements, it was uh, somewhere uh, in, in the summer, um, that they didn't match. It was a real panic, because I realized that after four years of PhD, I had built a machine that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> what else to hope? Nobody could imagine that such a star, such a planet would exist. So I entered really in a frenzied panic in a way that I had really to find out what's wrong. So I had been working for a couple of months until the end of the year, trying to reobserve the stars without telling anyone. Not even Michelle, I was so scared. <laughs> so I was continuing measuring, comparing, until the point I reached, I said, well, this is real, there is something real. And, and that day I remember very well because I was completely ill-prepared for that and I decided maybe it would be a good time to make an orbit. Well, I um, had no software to do an orbit because we were not ready, because nothing was, up, was supposed to happen that fast. So for, in a way, luckily I had a bad weather, a couple of days of bad weather, so I went to the library of the Observatoire de Haute Provence, read book, and, and programmed the, the software to solve the orbit of that, of that beast, and find a period that was not the right one at the beginning, and came back in January, up to the point, in then I'm talking 95 right now, and uh, where it was obvious that they were a real object, they were a real orbit with a real period. And at that time, I was convinced there was something here. And I was brave enough to send a famous fax to Michel Mayer saying, look, Michel, I think I found a planet. I was a bit scared of the answer, and Michel had his wonderful answer. He said, oh, yes, it's interesting, maybe. <laughs> it's great. I mean, I hope all the PhD advisors will be the same. <laughs> 
And then he came back, and we had to work quite hard to, to convince uh, the referees or the people, and then you know the story that becomes public there. So, so the, then very often after, uh, retrospectively, I'm thinking about why this discovery has been possible. So there's a couple of good reasons why, and, and it, was, it was touched upon by, by Dave, I mean, the importance of the technology here. Clearly, the, the, the optical fiber, the CCD, the new design of the spectrograph, also the global context, and we, been, we were aware that the brown graph were very rare at that time from, from the work of Dave, and all these gravel backgrounds, all this know-how, knowledge uh, from the past experiments, and also a couple of tricks that we had to be a bit creative to, to in a way, uh, 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 make sure that we would reach this, uh, this, this accuracy, which is, which is pictured on the biodata here. Um, coming back then to the situation today, I mean, right now, it's, we started with this point, and uh, it may look a bit bizarre, but practically at that point, we're just the tip of the iceberg here, because the situation today, this is it. This is the planet today, found by the Doppler techniques, about half of the planet that's been confirmed uh, that way. So, so there's a couple of things which is pretty obvious here. And, uh, it doesn't require a lot of study to understand that. Well, first of all, it's not very clear what is the upper mass of a planet. That's why Dave is very, very eager to wait for the Gaia data, and they will be from the planet. Possibly, I think it's high chance this is a planet, because when you, when you consider all the objects we have here, but at that time it was impossible to imagine they would exist. It was too far-fetched compared to, uh, to the global consensus, and nobody would have understood uh, this. Uh, the other one is we find a planet about the mass of the, of the Earth. Um, and they're not exactly that the Earth, but we have reached that level. It means that the number I show you, we're not exactly the number I show you, but very close. So tremendous progress that we've made in the technology to get into this point. But the key point uh, here is we have really nothing here. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's exciting for the, uh, for the PhD or the students in the room because there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> there is really a lot of work to be done. I mean, all the planets we have found, and practically there is one planet out of two or three stars, which is like that, uh, they're all different from the solar systems. We have a series of uh, sh small mass planet, uh, a very close orbit, with all these objects here. We call that the super Earth uh, here. But we not really have, we not, we not, it's not very clear whether we have something equivalent to the, to the solar systems. And the reason why is because it's tough. Uh, because the more you move here, the smaller the, the signal becomes. So it's extremely tough uh, to get to detect this object. So the good side of this is the fact we have this whole population of small period planet had a tremendous impact, and we'll have this with the talk after, because we have tons of transit. If this population did not exist, the number of transiting planets will be extremely, extremely small. But we have a vast majority of planets on very short orbit, and because they have short orbit, the, the, the chance of transit is very high. And having a transit gives you an access to the density of the planet. So this is all this, this planet for which we have the mass and, and the size. Picture in terms of the density here. So if you're not familiar with the density, well, this is, this is the water, this is the, the iron here. And, and what you do see on this picture is why we don't have really yet understood what's going on uh, on, the, on the size of the planet that may look like the Earth. Uh, we have a very interesting regime uh, when you move off from the Saturn to Jupiter. And, and this relation may seem to be bizarre. You, you, you may be puzzled, and I guess there will be talk after about this, that we have planet like Jupiter that, that, uh, that looks like a, a iron density planet. It's kind of very bizarre. It's the structure of the, of, of the matter that is different. But it's not iron, actually. It's, 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 still, it's still hydrogen and helium that is the, the most component here of these planets. And then we have this kind of intermediate region where nobody understands what's going on, because this is between the Saturn and the Earth. It's the regime where we don't really know exactly who is the planet. And there is a, a, a big debate and, and, and a lot of discussion about exactly the nature of this planet. And this is where you're going to have later the, uh, very likely the discussions about the outcome of Kepler that, that play a significant role into this, into this area here. So, so you see it's interesting because you start looking at something and you find something different, but actually it gives you access to something even more interesting, by the way, than the original idea. But we're coming back to the, to the original idea for sure eventually. Um, I cannot, I cannot uh, do this talk uh, without that picture, I think. And uh, I, think, I think because this picture, Tells, there is a lot to be said about this picture, 
or it was said that the picture has been, has been done, and I'm very pleased the picture has been done. I think I'm showing this picture almost every time I do a public talk, because first of all, it's an inspiration. I mean, I mean the, the, the idea uh, that, that the planet Earth, like we see it, is just, is just a dot for an astrophysicist, I think is the center of the game here. Because maybe in 20, 50 years, we will do some uh, similar picture on other planets, but it still will be a dot, and it will remain a dot for a long, long time on this other planet. So just to tell you how tremendously difficult. And the other thing that I like very much is the perceptions you can get. So the perception should be an inspiration here to us, and there is nothing best than that this, this famous sentence the, of, of Carl Sagan to try to, to translate these inspirations and this energy and this enthusiasm that uh, us scientists are having uh, and trying to do our best to share. And Carl, Carl was really a master into sharing this excitement. So, so I'm very pleased that I'm here and I hope you will enjoy this fantastic day. Thank you very much.